This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here with Jeffrey Sachs. He, uh, how would I say, I always smile and every time we talk, I'm paying homage to the Rommel family, uh, George and Affie Rommel, where we both grew up in Detroit and our parents were good friends with uh, the respective Rommels. And uh, perhaps that inspired my curiosity, even as an undergraduate at MIT, to learn more about Jeffrey Sachs. And it's been like a North Star beacon for me in thinking about what's important through my entire career. So Jeff, thanks for being here. I'll describe just briefly, you've done a tremendous amount of work here at Columbia University, the highest ranking professor. You ran the Earth Institute for many years, currently the president of the US Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I would say just as a signature, I see you always have, there's a gift that I perceive and that I admire and I try to turn people on to about your career. You always seem to choose important questions. People can do all kinds of dances with technique, but how do you say they might be fiddling while Rome burns? And you seem to zoom in over and over on things that matter, not just to your country or not just to prestige, but to humankind. And, and I greatly admire that. I just want to refer, you've written many, many books. We've talked about the age of globalization uh, in one of our previous episodes together, but sustainable development, the, the, the two I underscored today, because the questions related to the Ukraine that I've seen you writing about in Project Syndicate and other places recently, to move the world, JFK's quest for peace in 2013, and a new foreign policy beyond American exceptionalism. What I see there, First book, 2013, second book, 2018, is a prescience. You're seeing ahead of the, the challenges that we're going to have to address. So I'm very excited today that you're with me and we can talk about what you see, what scares you, and what's the way out. Well, thanks so much. Great, uh, It's great to be with you. And thank you for focusing on, uh, on those two books. Uh, the, uh, the book about uh, JFK, uh, which I wrote in 2013, was to uh, commemorate uh, an incredible speech and initiative of President Kennedy in 1963, which was just months after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, here we are, Rob, the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, with another kind of showdown between the United States and Russia. And so I'm going back to uh, that speech, to the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, to the lessons that I drew in that book just about every day in my thinking about uh, what uh, events are telling us right now. Uh, the 2019 book, uh, uh, A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism, uh, is also directly uh, uh, core to my thinking right now. I do think the United States doesn't get or accept uh, its uh, realistic, constructive place in the world right now, and that this is uh, at least a, a part of our problem uh, in a world that is uh, increasingly destabilized. I think that both books focus on one fundamental idea, which is that peace is better than war, and peace comes through a constructive engagement with the other side. Uh, President Kennedy said in his remarkable speech given at an American University commencement uh, uh, on June 10, 1963, uh, that uh, peace isn't some magic solution. It's not an event. Peace is a process a way of solving problems. Uh, it is a constructive engagement with the other side. It is uh, what I've uh, learned uh, in 21 years of advising uh, the UN leadership. Uh, it is diplomacy at its finest. Uh, it's not guessing what the other side will do. It's not playing uh, a game theory uh, where you take as given uh, the other party's move. Uh, which can have disastrous consequences, uh, but rather you engage 
And uh, I think that this has been my central uh, theme, uh, partly from my own life experience of working in cultures all over the world, very different uh, communities, different religions, races, ethnicities, nationalities, geographies. It taught me something about the uh, common fate of humanity, I, I think. Uh, and uh, it also taught me about the wonders of, uh, uh, of dialogue, communication, uh, and diplomacy. Well, here we are with war, with incredible tensions, uh, with China, uh, with the inability to solve major global problems uh, like the uh, increasing uh, derangement of the Earth's climate system. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, in all of these, what we're seeing is a failure of statecraft, a failure of concepts of cooperation, uh, a uh, really uh, an application of crude ideas that uh, are like the game theoretic ideas that assume the worst of the other side, for example, uh, and uh, assume you know what's in Putin's mind, assume you know uh, what is in President Xi's mind. And when we behave that way, we get very bad outcomes. So this, uh, uh, I, I thank you for focusing on those works. And for me, uh, they do reflect my underlying feeling that there's a different way for us, us to approach global problems, uh, different from what we're doing right now. And uh, it, would be, it would be much, much safer, more prudent, and more constructive to follow a different approach. Well, I find it fascinating just putting like what I'll call pattern recognition. You're talking about what John Kennedy did. I remember the old, what I'll call the Bismarck playbook. I took a bunch of courses in arms control and disarmament. And they said that one of the big dangers is when you're failing at home, there's discord. The Bismarck playbook is a metaphor. Find a, an external enemy so everybody can agree and focus on that. But sitting behind the Bismarck playbook in the first appendix to that playbook is the need to cooperate on climate change. So we're not in a place where, forget mutual assured destruction for a moment, we got to cooperate. Well, it's in There's another way we can exterminate Earth if we don't collaborate. And then the last thing I'll throw into this mix is a wonderful book by the scholar Orville Schell and his uh, colleague John Delury called Wealth and Power. And what Orville, who's a good friend of mine, said, he said, Rob, we've got a situation where the Chinese went through centuries of humiliation, opium war, Japanese invasion, etc." America thinks it runs the world and wants everybody to fall in line behind it. To use the big Brzezinski's uh, metaphor, we have tectonic plates crashing between two philosophical systems at the head table of the G7, or excuse me, of the G20 that used to be the G7. We are in a situation where you, can, you can't even play game theory with different philosophical systems because you're projecting things onto your counterpart that may never have been in their imagination or in their training. So you've got this instability, what I'll call the Bismarck playbook. You've got the end game of climate, and then you have this tension that centers on US China, but we could, we could bring, why didn't Russia, after the de-escalation of the end of the Soviet Union, and I know you've worked a lot there, so I don't know the answer to this at all, but why didn't Russia get the equivalent of a aid program to integrate them into the EU, regain prosperity, dignity through that. And I'll ask you a question. Is the political economy, the military industrial complex, a little bit of the evil that hides inside this dilemma of danger? So uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of intertwined uh, issues there. And let me start with the, the very specific issue of uh, climate change and the energy transformation that we know we need. <clears throat> we need to move to a zero carbon energy system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and that requires actually a lot of long-term thinking and a lot of international cooperation. 
So every day in the context of the Ukraine war, I'm asked by somebody, and it happened again this morning, uh, what's the implication of the war for climate change? In other words, uh, you see Russia um, you know, cutting off or threatening to cut off natural gas to Europe, or Europe putting on sanctions on uh, oil uh, and gas uh, uh, imports from Russia. Will this accelerate the energy uh, transition? And the answer is basically no, because uh, it, it may change the calculus uh, in the very short term. It's actually opening up more coal mines again or uh, pumping more gas and oil to make up for uh, what uh, has been lost from Russian supplies. Maybe it by raising the price of uh, oil and gas on world markets, uh, it's making some new solar projects uh, uh, more uh, economical and financeable. But all of that misses the, the main point, which is that the real changes we need are long-term strategic changes in the energy system. And that requires a stable, peaceful, cooperative environment, even renewable energy uh, to be efficient and effective needs to cross borders. It needs to be regional, uh, even globally connected in some ways, maybe in the new hydrogen economy. We can't do this if we're in conflict. We won't do this if we're in conflict. So this is the first point that almost everything of real value for development and what we now call and should call sustainable development, meaning economic development that is also socially just and environmentally sustainable, requires a long perspective. If you have a short perspective because of huge uncertainties, because of war, because of conflict, then you can't accomplish anything real of the transformations that we need. You can improvise, you can uh, maybe uh, keep your footing in the short term, perhaps. But the truth of the matter is real development of any kind requires years, even decades of hard, continuous work, educating children, building infrastructure, uh, cooperating across uh, river sheds, uh, uh, building uh, power transmission grids that are, uh, again, transnational. And that is a long-term cooperative effort that depends on peace. And we're not getting there right now, uh, partly because our mindsets really are wrong. Uh, and unfortunately, what I have invade against in the U.S. context is the idea, which is very popular, it's in every speech of U.S. leaders, that the world is safe when the United States leads the world. So primacy, or what the political scientists call hegemony, is really built into the American thinking. I think Henry Luce <laughs> did a, uh, an unfortunate uh, thing to America when he in 1941, christened this as the American century. Uh, you know, it was a great turn of phrase, by the way, so inspiring uh, and uh, so uh, ennobling, but it, it actually basically went to the heads of the permanent state uh, that they took it literally. <laughs> this is our century. You know, in the past, it was Britain's century. Uh, in the industrial age of the 19th century, or it was the Mongol century, or it was the Roman centuries. Now it's our century. Oh, what a dangerous way to think about things because you get way overstretched. Uh, you act provocatively without even attempting to understand the other side. And that, unfortunately, is so much of what happened in uh, Europe after uh, the 19th 90 remarkable transformation. And as you know, I was there. I was physically present in the Kremlin uh, in December uh, 1991. You couldn't even believe, I mean, I could not believe, uh, and especially you'd appreciate it, you know, a kid from Detroit sitting in the Kremlin uh, in this huge office and uh, who walks in the far door, Boris Yeltsin, 
And he walks across the room uh, and he sat down right in front of me because I was leading the delegation. And he said, gentlemen, because it was all men, he said, gentlemen, in the next room is the leaders of the uh, Soviet military. And I have just agreed with them to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I heard literally those words. Wow. Yeah. Wow is wow, <laughs> wow is exactly right. It was weird. Point. Huge turning. <laughs> no. So yeah. I thought, wow. and I, I had been working in uh, in the Soviet Union before that. In I was I was told, I don't know if it's true, uh, that I was the uh, first person to brief the Gosplan leadership in its entirety uh, on the top floor of Gosplan, just outside of Red Square uh, in 1990 uh, to uh, the Politburo leader uh, who headed Gosplan on the transformation to a market economy. And they were taking notes of 50 Soviet leaders on the other side, all with notebooks open, taking copious notes about market uh, economics. But the uh, the fact of the matter is Gorbachev and Yeltsin wanted a common home. You, Gorbachev, who I regard as the greatest statesman of our age and who's reviled in Russia for having lost the Soviet uh, Union and, and for inflation and everything else, he's the greatest statesman of our age because he understood that what we needed was peace rather than a cold or hot wars, and he was uh, ready to even let the system fall rather than shoot people uh, to, uh, quote, save the old system. But his idea, which I know, was a common home from Rotterdam to Vladivostok, uh, that we have a common European home. I believed it. I went to work for his team in 1991, promoting what we called the, the, the grand bargain, working with Graham Allison, who was uh, then head of the Kennedy School at Harvard, and Stanley Fisher and others. And we recommended a significant financial assistance program to the Soviet Union for to support its economic and political reforms. What was the White House response? Complete yet <laughs> nothing. Nichevo. <laughs> not anything. Yeah. We're not doing this. Okay. Uh, that... Uh, uh, was a disaster for, uh, I mean, the, the failure of Western support uh, definitely uh, um, undermined uh, under, undermined uh, Gorbachev. Uh, Yeltsin emerged uh, after the attempted putsch against uh, Gorbachev, uh, which was in the summer of August uh, 1991. Uh, and then I was contacted by uh, Yeltsin's uh, economic uh, leader, uh, Yegor Gaidar, uh, and I came to Moscow. And Yeltsin said to me uh, and said to others, I want a normal country. I want a democratic country with the market economy, and I want normal relations with the world. I said, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> this is exactly what we want. And, you know, uh, Gaidar, who was uh, then the acting premier of Russia, uh, which was about to become the sovereign country, was meeting with the G7 finance deputies in November 1991. And Russia was running out of foreign exchange reserves. This was a fulminant financial crisis. So I knew a lot about financial crises and their history and their resolution and worked with Poland a couple of years before. And I asked, uh, I suggested to Gaida, well, look, tell uh, the U.S. and uh, the other six uh, deputy finance ministers, you need a standstill on the debt payments because you're running out of reserves and uh, Russia is about to become an independent country and we can't have a financial collapse. And he came out of the meeting just absolutely ashen faced. He said they wouldn't even consider it. They said, you have to pay to the penny. Uh, we will not uh, allow anything right now. We're not authorized to allow anything. We will not allow anything. You continue to pay. Russia ran out of reserves at the beginning of 1992 as Yeltsin came to power. In other words, a fulminant 
financial crisis. I couldn't believe it. I spent two unbelievably frustrating years trying to get the U.S. and the IMF to do something. And they wouldn't do anything. And uh, Larry Eagleberger, who was acting secretary of state, explained to me at one point, said, Mr. Sachs, it's not even about what you're advising. Even if I agreed with it, it's not going to happen. And he said, you know, this is an election year. It's not going to happen. And the truth is, you know, this this didn't determine all the future. But God, did it show an attitude of obtuseness in the United States. And I didn't appreciate then that Cheney and Wolfowitz were working on their great neocon uh, illusions that now we're the sole superpower. Now we get to do what we want. And they really were working on the next wars because they were going to take away every Soviet ally or Russian ally in the Middle East knock out uh, Libya, Syria, uh, Iraq. This was a plan already from the early 1990s, according to oh, Wesley yeah. Smith. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I didn't know it at the time. I just couldn't believe here we are, this historic moment, a chance to cooperate. Uh, and uh, no, we're not going to cooperate. We're going to be the sole superpower. And yeah. I just found that obtuseness year after year from the U.S., and by the end of the 1990s, whew, I basically had had it because I had seen the U.S. now from all sides. I had seen it from the Latin American perspective. I had seen it from the Central European perspective. I had seen it from the Russian perspective. I had seen it from the Indonesian perspective in 1997. We just were not a cooperative country that aimed to work with other countries to solve problems. We were the unipolar great power of the world. We were arrogant uh, and we were not paying attention to what other countries said. And this manifested itself in a number of financial debacles of these countries that uh, had big effects on the world. It also manifested in what brings us to the war in Ukraine today, though this is a very unpopular view. It's right. And that is NATO enlargement. What John Mearsheimer has said is right. Kissinger said it. Uh, and so many other wise people, George Kennan said it in 1997, don't do this NATO enlargement. It'll lead to a new Cold War. Uh, now we have a hot war. Uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, under Clinton was deciding whether to resign or not when he uh, learned that Clinton indeed would go ahead with NATO enlargement because Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, said, look, we're, we're starting to improve relations with Russia. Do we really need to risk that right now? by peremptory moves yes. of NATO enlargement, especially since unequivocally uh, both the Germans and the Americans had promised Gorbachev and then Yeltsin no enlargement in uh, return for uh, German reunification. Then we lied about it. Well, it's not in writing. We brought out all our lawyers, but good historians know uh, that those commitments were made and we just want to deny that. And given, you know, the predominance of uh, U.S. government in our media, you can tell any story you want. This is absolutely, yeah. uh, absolutely true. But the long and the short of it, Rob, is that um, NATO enlargement started. We weren't giving any financial help. We were plotting wars against Saddam Hussein. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, Assad, all the allies of the former Soviet Union uh, or of the Soviet Union and, and then of Russia. Uh, Russia has military uh, naval base uh, in uh, in Syria. So Assad was would be our target and so forth. No cooperation other than superficial. And in the 1990s, the NATO enlargement started. And then during George W. Bush, 
Well, actually, Clinton did something that, you know, in, in retrospect, we didn't even see the significance of, but it was hugely significant and misguided. Uh, and that was uh, the war against Serbia in 1999 uh, to uh, force Serbia to give up Kosovo. Uh, so there was a rebellion of the uh, Kosovar uh, Albanians or Albanian Kosovars, I should say, uh, in Serbia. And the U.S. took sides and said, let them break away. Uh, and when Serbia said, no, they're part of Serbia, which is the normal way that diplomacy works, uh, the U.S. bombed uh, Belgrade for several weeks. And we set up the precedent that uh, if you want a breakaway state or you want to weaken the other side, you just go bomb them. Uh, and then when Russia says, well, when we do this, uh, you know, we're called the crime of humanity. But when NATO does it, uh, that passes as uh, defending freedom fighters. So isn't there no standard or a double standard? But just to carry on to the, the current day, in the early 2000s, after the Belgrade bombing, uh, and then after 9-11, of course, Bush pushed the enlargement of NATO to, uh, I think, seven countries under his watch, an extraordinary uh, increase of the number of countries. The Baltic states, uh, to begin with, the Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Slovenia, if I remember correctly, all during Bush's watch. And then to the shock of the Europeans in NATO in 2008, he said uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. And just take a look at a map, uh, and I encourage everybody to take a look at the map of the Black Sea. What was NATO's idea? What was the U.S. strategic idea? The U.S. strategic idea was basically to own the Black Sea for NATO, because you'd have Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and where's Georgia? All the way over on the yeah. eastern side of the Black Sea suddenly is going to be a NATO country, whereas NATO was originally to defend against an invasion by a now defunct, non-existent country in Western Europe. So suddenly it is an expansionary force moving straight across the Black Sea. It reminds me a lot of the Crimean War of the 19th century. Who controls the Black Sea? And well, one thing has led to another, and we have the war in Ukraine. And if in our media you say, you know, the United States played a provocative war, you're immediately targeted. Oh, you're you're just purveying Putin's propaganda. Well, this is really nonsense. We need a serious discussion, some context, some history. And we should not have pushed NATO right up against Russia's edge and right around the encirclement of the Black Sea. But we did so. And uh, now we're uh, also paying consequences for this, but especially Ukraine is paying consequences for this. Yeah. I remember uh, some of my teachers at MIT in that arms control disarmament. I once, this was years after I was a student, but I ran into Bill Kaufman and I said, uh, you know, this doesn't feel like game theory to me. It feels like the chain store paradox, which is you never should engage in each of these things, but you act like you got to do it to show you're tough to the next three episodes. But with consequences being so dangerous, you know, what? with regard to nuclear war and now with regard to climate, this is madness and this is not leadership. Why are our leaders so afraid of our population at this juncture that they have to put on this ritual of toughness as opposed to doing what needs to be done? Did, did you play the game of risk uh, as, as a, the board yeah, game yeah. risk? OK, so yeah, the board game the risk yeah. really is a is a, a marvelous model of uh, how Washington thinking is. You have the map of the world. And the aim of the game is to have your piece on every space of the world. And uh, as you move forward, if you're successful and your, your armies are advancing into new territory, every new territory you have 
has borders with the enemy. And suddenly, every new border becomes the conflict zone. Every new border becomes vital for your national security. And so you have to have every space on the board or suddenly you're at risk. Now, American strategists get this or behave this way. I think it's it's mind boggling because we shouldn't be playing a game of risk where you're trying to conquer the world. But this is the American strategist approach. And a, a good example of it is the Solomon Islands, tiny <clears throat> islands, 3,200 kilometers off the coast of Australia that uh, yep. had the audacity to sign a security pact with China. And suddenly the United States and Australia are in a tizzy. Uh, how dare they? This is a threat to security. And you hear the voices in the U.S. Congress, you know, uh, completely unacceptable uh, that there's a security pact uh, because you give China one inch, they'll take the world. But when the United States says, uh, well, NATO should enlarge <laughs> to Georgia and Ukraine and Russia says, no, that's a security concern. We laugh. We say, why is it a security concern? We're peace loving. We're we're wonderful. And that's their choice. That's not our choice. We didn't say, well, that's the Solomon Islands choice. We dispatched the deputy of the National Security Council to Asia on an urgent mission to express the U.S. displeasure uh, at the Solomon Islands uh, decision to enter this pact with China. So much, Rob, comes from the unwillingness to really have rules that apply to yourself as well as to others, or to think empathetically, what is the other side thinking? And it comes back, by the way, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think we should talk about that because it's absolutely relevant. Yeah. When uh, Cuba put, when uh, Khrushchev put the uh, uh, nuclear uh, or the atomic uh, weapons in Cuba, all of Kennedy's advisors, except one, except Adlai Stevenson, said from the start, you must attack and take them out. We need a military operation. Many things can be said about that, but I think the bottom line is it would have started World War III uh, because the CIA had every fact wrong. Uh, it thought that the missiles were not yet operational. It completely underestimated, roughly by a factor of seven, how many Soviet troops were actually in Cuba, how many would be killed uh, in a military uh, operation and so forth. Kennedy did a remarkable thing. He kept asking one question. What is in Khrushchev's mind? What is he thinking? In other words, Kennedy behaved empathetically. Uh, it didn't mean he sympathized with Khrushchev. He was thinking, what is Khrushchev thinking? What is his point of view? Does he want war? Uh, what is he trying to prove? Kennedy had to learn, actually, the details that there were U.S. Yes. missiles in Turkey. What are they? Why are they there? Who put them there? And so on. But by uh, the second week of the crisis, Kennedy realized Khrushchev didn't want war, but he did want to put America's face in it, you know, because uh, the U.S. had its uh, uh, Turkish missiles uh, or its missiles in Turkey pointed right uh, on the border of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, the U.S. had invaded Cuba in the Bay of Pigs operation and so forth. Right. Kennedy realized, you know what, we got to get out of this by a compromise. Uh, you remove your missiles. We remove our missiles. We commit never to uh, to uh, invade Cuba again. And that's how the crisis was resolved. It wasn't, we demand victory because Khrushchev has done the most dastardly deed. So we must defeat that man, which is the rhetoric that we have today. Uh, must defeat Putin with his 1,600 hundred active nuclear warheads. We must defeat Putin. This is mind boggling that even 
on an anniversary like this, 60 years anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we're not taking care to learn the real lessons of how you diffuse a crisis. And you start with empathy. You say, if we care about the Solomon Islands, hmm, maybe Russia cares about Ukraine and Georgia in the same way. Maybe we shouldn't be quite so provocative. Maybe we shouldn't be talking about humiliating defeat and so forth. Or maybe we shouldn't be saying this is the the worst crime in modern history when the United States is engaged in so many wars of choice. And maybe we should find a way for both sides to stand down. Yeah. Well, I see. Uh, I remember reading Daniel Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine. Absolutely. About that there were many nuclear weapons inside of submarines off the coast of Cuba. And we started dropping depth depth charges on them. And but for I can't remember the gentleman's name. Yeah. Who overruled firing the missiles? They were terrified. They're underwater, and the depth charges are going off, trying to essentially kill them all and drown them all. Absolutely and, right. And, and this it, guy wouldn't allow the missiles to be shot. But it's that close. That, it's that close to extermination. So, and, re- reading list for everybody listening: uh, Daniel Ellsberg, the Doomsday Machine, and mm-hmm. Martin Sherwin. Gambling with Armageddon, which is the finest yes. book ever written yes. about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, yes. Martin Sherwin tells this story that you're uh, so importantly referring to, Rob. And I think it has many lessons. But what happened is even after Kennedy and Khrushchev had agreed on the way out, a disabled Soviet submarine in the Caribbean that was out of radio contact, so it had no news, right. was right. disabled, it was overheating, it needed to surface just to breathe. Uh, sailors were uh, fainting, uh, and it right. started to surface, and a jackass in the U.S. Air Force, instead of dropping depth charges, dropped live hand grenades on the submarine wow. as a joke. And he's, you know, we'll scare the hell out of them. So the uh, the, the uh, commander of the vessel ordered a nuclear tipped submarine to be put into the uh, a nuclear tipped torpedo to be put into the torpedo it's bay yeah. and called for its launch. And it happened by coincidence that a Soviet party official, a communist party official, was on that vessel named Antipov. And he had the ability to override the order of the skipper of the uh, of the submarine. And he said, no, yeah. we're going to surface. We're not going to fire this. And under U.S. military doctrine described by uh, Ellsberg and by Sherwin, if the U.S. was attacked by a nuclear weapon, even a nuclear tipped submarine, our military doctrine said we would unleash the full scale response of a complete attack on yes. the Soviet Union, China, and all of the other countries of the Soviet system. And the estimate was 700 million dead. But what they didn't know was about nuclear winter, because such an attack could yeah. have ended yeah. life, uh, human life on the planet. We came right. within seconds of this. We're stupid yes. if we think that things can't get out of hand. Today, I read about a gen- U.S. general saying, well, we may need to uh, break the Soviet blockade of the port uh, of Odessa uh, to let Ukrainian grain supplies. I'm sick of these generals telling us uh, about things that are so unbelievably risky without a proper public debate and understanding because we could end up in nuclear war. And mm-hmm. this is uh, mind boggling that we are having generals opine on uh, these kinds of military operations, which would be tantamount to direct US war with Russia in this kind of way. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about the uh, extermination of life on earth. I mean, these are not rumors. 
I've seen in Nature and Science magazine studies of what happens to the upper atmosphere if there's a nuclear exchange. And I, I, I encourage many people now, I've been doing a little bit of work with a group called the Quincy Institute, Andrew Basevich. Excellent. And yep. Har, Hartung in this group uh, and uh, exploring some of the ramifications for how our military decisions are being made. And it's really quite, it's, it's really quite haunting to try to understand this dynamic as having anything to do with representing the well-being of America or mankind. And I, I learned in, in thinking about American history and politics, which I've been doing pretty much nonstop for 50 years now, uh, it, it turns out the president's main job in the world is to keep a foot on the brake of the U.S. military <laughs> machine. Uh, because uh, it's like those old cars that are poorly tuned, that uh, though they're in neutral, they're always revving forward uh, and they're always jumping. You take your foot off the brake, the car jumps forward. And good presidents, great presidents have been the ones to have the foot on the brake, like Kennedy had the foot on the brake in October uh, 1962. Johnson yes. did not have the foot on the brake and we escalated in Vietnam. Uh, I, we know that uh, Bush, <laughs> uh, I don't even know if he was in the driver's seat, much less having a foot on the brake, uh, but we went to so many wars. Obama was no good at this either. Uh, so this is a real question. It's uh, a systemic you know, process. Yeah. It, 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 it is like the game of risk. You're always looking, oh, uh, we're you know in Romania and Bulgaria, we're at risk unless we're also in Ukraine. Uh, so we better expand. Well, you know, then there could be uh, uh, losses uh, in the eastern uh, Black Sea and, and the Caucasus. So we better expand to Georgia, et cetera, et cetera, or, or the Solomon Islands or uh, what we're doing uh, in East Asia. And just so much chit chat about war with Taiwan and U.S. war with China and Biden piping off and so forth. All of it is provocative. Uh, all of it requires actually our good luck that a president says, no, we're not going farther. Uh, Korean War, uh, again, uh, had uh, MacArthur had his way, he would have invaded China. Uh, we would have used nuclear weapons at the time. Truman, his, uh, his right decision, no, stop. He had to fire his top general. Uh, this is really the job of uh, of the American president, because the underlying revving machine doesn't have a natural stopping point. Yeah, I remember I had uh, the late Charles Johnson was a good friend of mine, and uh, I was doing a lot of work in Japan at the time. Yeah. But he was working on the books like Blowback. He wrote that trilogy yeah. about the dangers that foreshadowed the attack of 9-11, saying exactly. if, you, if, you're, if you're aggressive, you are going to have these consequences putting the American people at risk. But let me, let me shift, Jeff, as we're coming down the home stretch to the relation of all of this to budget and the well-being of America. What concerns me is at the level of medical care, the OECD data shows that America per capita spends more than twice the average in the OECD to have some healthcare system that is ranked 38th in the world by the WHO. The second dimension is we have a baby boom creating a demographic bulge where elder care is going to be a priority. We are going through technological transformation that requires transforming the education system towards knowledge intensive things. Uh, what was his name? Sir Ken Robinson, the most famous TED talk of all time, how schools kill creativity. We got to change that. That involves investment. Now we've got this military urge and climate transformation. I guess I worked on the Senate budget committee under Pete Domenici and I'm thinking, how are we going to get all this stuff done if we keep playing these aggressive military games? And how are we going to harness 
the political economy. I always laughed. Domenici said to me one time, well, you're an economist. You know that thing called Say's Law? I said, yeah. He said, how supply creates its own demand? I said, yes. Yes, Senator. He says, well, you watch. Every year when we put up the budget, about the time that the military budgets come up, you're going to see all kinds of news about how dangerous the world is. They're, they're, <laughs> creating, they're using fear to create their own demand. And Adam Curtis, the BBC documentary, he created a series, a three-part series that you can watch for free on thoughtmaybe.com. And it's called The Power of Nightmares. And so, Jeff, I'm loading you all up, but you can, you can't sit there and be, uh, how would I say, self-righteous budget hawk, tolerate a military-industrial complex that's spending 22 times what any other country is, neglecting older people, neglecting young people, and letting our healthcare system cost twice what it should. What? And with all the discord of not reconciling those things, the Bismarck playbook comes back into center stage. Well, you know, one one of uh, the uh, expressions of Joe Biden that I really like, uh, though I haven't heard it from him uh, recently for an obvious reason, uh, he said, don't talk to me about your values. Show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. Uh, and what he, what he means by that is where you put your money, that's what counts in the system. Yeah. And the United yes. States uh, has really <clears throat> messed up <clears throat> the budget. It spends far too little on many areas like education, like well-being of children. Uh, it spends far too much on other areas like the so-called modernization of our nuclear uh, fleet, uh, arsenal, uh, when we should be negotiating uh, long-term uh, nuclear disarmament. Uh, and in general, uh, our budget is a mess. Uh, as you say, also, the way we organize key parts of the economy, like healthcare, is to give private monopolies to a crucial sector, ending up overpaying roughly by a factor two for our health care. We spent almost 20% of GDP on health care compared to roughly 10% of GDP in our peer countries. So I've, I've written a number of books, uh, The Price of Civilization, uh, mm -hmm. being one of uh, my favorites, <laughs> about what a budget would look like for a civilized country. And interestingly, I... Uh, and one of the better parts of a speech that uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken just gave about uh, U.S. Uh, approaches to China, he said the real approach is we need to invest in ourselves. We need to strengthen our capacities in science, education, uh, our <coughs> well-being at home, because that's what makes us the competitive model vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, including vis-a-vis -vis China. And uh, that's true. But we're not doing it. And we have lost the budget debate and the budget narrative in the last two years. Biden came in with the idea of a package uh, to build back better. Uh, it did not appear. What happens in the United States is essentially key sectors are in the hands of powerful lobbies. Uh, and military industrial complex is one of them. Big oil is another or fossil fuel industry is another. Uh, the uh, healthcare, private uh, healthcare sector is a third. Those are favored by the budget. Uh, they are favored by regulation. Uh, and areas that don't have <laughs> such powerful lobbies don't see the light of day. And in general, the United States under taxes, even though we're told all the time that we're being crushed by taxes, the total government revenues in the United States for federal, state, and local are about 30% of GDP of national income. But in Northern Europe, which ranks much better in healthcare and longevity, uh, in many quality of life <laughs> indicators, about 45% of GDP. Uh, so 
The fact of the matter is the budget's a mess. And what foundered for Biden in the end, why didn't his package go through? Because nobody wanted to pay for it with taxation. And it all unraveled when uh, Senator Sinema said, I, I don't want to have a rise of the corporate tax rate. And Manchin said, I don't like that billionaire tax. And uh, we ended up with nothing. Uh, Biden mm -hmm. ended up empty handed, ineffective politics, by the way. So I, I think a president ought to be able to uh, keep a couple uh, senators uh, uh, in in the fold, and he failed to do so. And that's part of his job also is to know how to twist arms or cajole or uh, give uh, whatever side payments uh, for new projects right. in West Virginia. You get something done, you make a deal. But he, he could not make a deal. He failed on that. So we have nothing. <laughs> so we have a, bu a budget mess. And by the way, a budget mess also with a mountain of debt, uh, now 100% of GDP of public debt, that's actually consequential. With interest rates yes. going up, the burden of that debt is also going to be quite significant. We need to raise some taxes and we need to restructure what we spend, but we're a blocked political system. So uh, we, are, we are not showing uh, a way forward on this and I'm not holding my breath. Nothing's going to happen probably the Democrats are going to lose one or both houses of Congress in the fall. If that happens, I, I would guess there would be no significant uh, budgetary reform or action until 2025. Yeah. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, I mentioned at the outset that you and I grew up in Detroit. And I remember one of my father's friends said to me, you know, D Detroit is the place that America divorced because they wanted to believe in the American dream. And when we had our stresses in the 60s, 70s, things like Tom Sugru's book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis in Detroit, he said uh, they'd had the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and all the Democrats in the South were afraid to, avoid, to vote to support the transformation of a black majority, black governed, meaning Coleman Young as mayor. So we we got divorced from, we were no longer America. We were a bad example. And you and I have done work together in Detroit and been at numerous meetings. And I, I often think of uh, the kind of pressures that, I remember in 1990, there was this headline in CNN, Detroit is the shadow that looms over the future of America. It's, in other words, it's an it's an indicator, it's an early warning, like the canary in the coal mine, of toxic political economy. And so, when I thought about talking with you today, I often go back to my my musical origins. There was a guy that actually played my senior prom named Bob Seeger. Oh, or, oh my God! Got, <laughs> and, and, and as well I done. followed you, <laughs> I missed that I problem. followed you. <laughs> I followed you for many, many years as a younger person from Detroit, but with family, mutual friends who were guiding me to look at your example. Bob Seger wrote a song that made me think of you. It's called "Traveling Man," and at the end of the song, as he's reflected on all of this. He says, sometimes at night, I see their faces. I feel the traces they've left on my soul. Those are the memories that make me a wealthy soul. Wow. Jeff, you give me that kind of inspiration, curiosity. I follow your work. I have since I was, I guess, a senior in high school. And uh, I think it's amazing how you, after the, what we might call the woundedness of Detroit, all the things you've described today in all your international involvement remain so constructive. And I'm very grateful for that. Well, Rob, thank I'm you. grateful that we do it together. And uh, thank you for those lovely words. Yes. But uh, we, we've been on a journey together and uh, your leadership of INET and constructive new approaches uh, to these issues is essential. So I really thank you and how great to be together with you today. Yeah, thank you. And we'll, uh, how would I say, 
pause now and wait for the, the next turn of events in the next chapter. But I look forward to working with you in the days ahead. And uh, once again, I'm very grateful for the example you set for our young scholars and for our country. Thank you so much.